Hi, everyone. Uh, very good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, AI and Big Data in Finance webinar series. I know we are all in different time zones. So good afternoon, good morning, good evenings to all of you. Today, we are really delighted to have two uh, very distinguished scholars with us and thought leaders uh, in this area. Um, for the speaker, we have um, Jerry Holberg from USC with us. He will be presenting the paper on scope, scale, and competition, the 21st century firm. And our discussion for today is David Robinson from Duke University. And uh, we have a slightly different uh, format for today's webinar. Jerry will be giving 30 minutes of the uh, presentation. And after 15 or 20 minutes or so, we'll have a a uh, quick pause to take clarification questions. And after this 30 minutes is up, David will have 15 to 18 minutes for his discussion. And we'll use the remainder of the time to open the floor for questions from the audience. And to our audience, please submit your questions in the Q&A box. And I will then read your questions and directly call on you during the Q&A. The presentation and discussion will be recorded and together with the slides will be posted on our website. After the main part of the webinar, which is about an hour long, we'll have another 15 minutes of unrecorded discussion where everyone in the audience will have a chance to join us as panelists to ask questions and discuss the topic further. Um, Jerry, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay, everything good? Yes, perfect. So, so thank you. Um, you know, this paper is joint with Gordon Phillips. It is not under submission. It's, it's a working paper and we're actively gathering a lot of comments. We're still working on methodology. So we really, really appreciate the invitation to be here. And all comments will be uh, very much internalized by both Gordon and I. So uh, we're going to talk about, you know, scale and scope, but primarily scope, because scale is something that, you know, folks in the literature are very good at measuring and understanding that's firm size. But what we think is really missing in a lot of the literature that we see with the level of detail that we, we think is possible to really understand some of the corporate finance issues when firms have multiple products. So I want us to start to think about as we get into the paper here, what is scope really? It's different from scale where firms, you think, just get larger and sell more of the same stuff. But we want to think about scope, which is you, you may be getting bigger, but the, the very definitional aspect of it is that you're selling multiple products, right? Multiple product firms have high scope. And there is some literature in finance that gets into multiple product firms, but what really motivated us to write this particular paper is that there's something in the economics literature that we think of as very seminal that's really missing from the debate in corporate finance on multiple product firms or conglomerates, which is the term that's usually used in the finance literature. And that is uh, the theory of Panzer and Willig, uh, which is really the most seminal beginning of this literature about economies of scope, where the main idea is that a company is gonna expand from one market into a market that's nearby um, because it has certain skills by virtue of being in the market it's in that make the cost of moving to the new market lower. So expansion through a lower cost of entry, uh, especially into neighboring markets where your skills are likely to be very useful in that expansion. Now, that, that's very seminal and there's been a lot of work following on it, um, you know, Thies and Henderson and Cockburn as well, that suggests that innovation facilitates this. So you use R&D to, if you will, refine your capabilities, which makes the entry even lower cost still. And, and so these are the types of issues that we see in some of the foundational literature on economies of scope. But then, okay, if we look at the finance literature where corporate finance really studies a lot, a lot of effort, hundreds of sites and papers that focus on the concept of conglomerates, the focus of that literature is very heavily on diversification. And I wanna emphasize that the concept of diversification is far away markets. It's exactly the opposite 
of what Tanzer and Willig and some of their foundational work are telling us that we should focus on. So our thesis is really to bring Tanzer and Willig and to test it using some new data based on natural language processing where we think we have the ability to do so and that existing data doesn't allow you to do this very well. And our thesis is that the Panzer and Willig idea is alive and well and actually explains a lot of what you see um, in, in companies expanding. You think about Amazon sells so many products, right? Um, that, that example is, is very intuitive in this setting. And so we wanna rethink the conglomerate foundation to be one about close in multi-product expansion and, and sort of maybe the world is not all about diversification. After all, if you look in the popular press, uh, even in the last couple of weeks, you see that firms like General Electric, which conform to the old literature, are breaking up. So there's something different going on today, and hence the title we have, the 21st century firm, that the multi-product firm is not really like General Electric anymore, uh, which is diversified, but it's really something that's about close-in expansion, right? So there's a lot of literature and I, I don't have time to get into it, but you all know that I'm referring to uh, the conglomerate literature, uh, Berger and OFAC. There's a lot of uh, discussion of agency and underperformance. What we want to suggest is that when you look at the Panzer and Willig format, a way of thinking, the prediction is for higher valuations, okay? So we have conglomerate discounts in the past about lower valuations. Our, our, our thesis says that this is really value creating way of, of building firms into multi-product firms. Some basic stylized facts, firms are getting bigger. We all know that. Um, this is just CompuStat assets over time. But what you may not have known is this picture. Okay, I'm gonna get into the method soon. We're measuring how many products markets a firm really covers. And now we're just counting the markets and then plotting the average number of markets a firm covers over time. And what you wanna see is that there is a very strong upward pattern, particularly in this dark black line, which is the one that uses the NLP to its fullest ability right now. The more, the more in a sense you rely on technology, the sharper the image gets. Uh, the, the conclusion is that firms, Amazon is not a one-off, that this is averaged over all of the CompuSat firms that we see that they tend to cover more and more markets over time. And you, you could say that the increase is economically large, 70% uh, since 1989 and 40% if we use uh, a more historical driven measure, but still economically large. And so what, what's particularly remarkable and I think motivates the importance of a paper like this is that if you were to ignore the NLP and try to do this paper based on the data that's already out there, I think we would say that most folks would rely on the CompuSat segment tapes. And here is what you would get. I'm just plotting the average number of CompuSat segments over time, and there's no upward trend at all. And so what I wanna suggest is that the NLP is crucial, not just to improving accuracy of something we can already find, but it actually changes the inference. And you're gonna see that throughout this paper. Why is it the CompuSat segments don't work very well? To understand that you need only read the rule that governs their creation, which is SFS uh, 131, that says the rules for creating segment reporting is that you should, you should report segments when you see um, basically performance evaluation bundles. So if I operate in two markets, but if I as a manager think of the performance of them as a bundle, then I, I treat it as one segment but I have another market that performance evaluation as a bundle, that's another market. So I would count two in that case. But the key thing is that the way a manager evaluates performance is not necessarily mapping one-to-one -one with the actual markets you serve, particularly when the markets are the Panzer and Willig close together kind, right? You think they're close together, a manager may evaluate their performance uh, as a bundle and therefore you miss it in the segment tapes entirely. So um, the, the overall view, and I, I don't have a lot of time to get into the method as much as I will, I'll get into it some later, is that we are going to use the, the text in the business description, and I'm color coding it to show you that what our goal is to take a given firm and to identify the clusters of vocabulary that exist. So you have a cluster of vocabulary that generally talks about cell phones. We're gonna call you a firm that's in the cell phone industry. If you have electronics vocabulary, we're gonna call you in the electronics as well. And this sample firm would have a scope of four. 
we found four distinct clusters. But the CompuSat segments, again, is based like this on performance evaluation. And the intuition I want you to see is the analog is that a manager may think about cell phones and electronics. They want to evaluate it together. The segment count will only be one for that. And then two, the furniture and the office equipment, they may evaluate it together. So you're going to get a lot of this underreporting in the CompuSat segments, especially when the markets you cover are highly related, because it makes sense to think of performance evaluation together in that case. OK, so just the, the end of our, our motivation here is I just want to say that a lot of research in corporate finance and asset pricing and even beyond their own discipline of financial economics really uh, forces the researcher, in a sense, to think about firms as only being in one market. Like when you use SIC code fixed effects, you're doing this. OK, but underlying all of that, what we're really seeing in the data is that companies really don't fit neatly into one market. And, and we need a new way, a new platform for trying to model that. And so, you know, firms expand, they cover multiple markets. It's very endogenous process. Acquisitions do this. R&D does this. It's really the ideas of Panzer and Willig. Uh, we live in a very dynamic world. And so, so that's really what we're trying to do, even beyond our own agenda, is to produce a framework that, that others could tap as well here. And so on to the data and methods. OK, we're, we're going to use item ones in the 10K. This is um, something that, that's not new in this paper. Gordon and I used this kind of framework uh, back in 2016 and, and even in 2010. Um, we're also going to, and I won't have time to get into all of it today, we're, we're going to use some basic methods of, of textual similarity cosines. We also have a version of it based on a latent Dirichlet allocation methodology. And we're working on another method that's not in the paper yet, based on Doctivec embeddings and clustering overlaid uh, on top of the embeddings, uh, but that's still to come. And so the idea is now the methodology, what was really the hardest part of this project is to identify the clusters of vocabulary. What is a cell phone cluster? What is a cluster of electronics, okay? So what I want to su suggest here is that there's actually many ways you can do this, and we, we try a bunch. We're going to always get the same conclusion about scope increasing and the economics that we test. But one method is we just use the, the, the clusters that are a direct result of the work I have with Gordon in 2016, where we, you, it's called the FIC classification. You can look it up, it's on the web as well. You can download that data. But each, each industry, we detect 300 clusters, has a sub vocabulary associated with it. And those are the industries, and those are the clusters of vocabulary. Or we can just take the NAIX manual, uh, which you can Google and find on the web. There's a 500 page manual that verbally describes all the industries that are NAIX codes. We, we can define the vocabularies that way. So if you're not, if you're not willing to trust the NLP yet, uh, what I want to suggest is that we can just take the NAIX manual and we still get the same results. And, and the CompuStat data just doesn't generate the same results for reasons likely uh, that I talked about earlier about SFAS. So, so once we have the clusters, this is something that exists once per industry, we look at the firms and, and we look at the vocabulary each firm has to really count the number of, of segments it operates in based on the, the amount of each cluster it has. If you have enough of this orange text that covers this cluster uh, above a threshold, we're gonna say that you're in the cell phone industry. And then similarly, this firm is also in electronics. Um, so that's just a very graphical view of what we're doing. Um, a lot of the details is representing text as vectors is, is in the paper, but uh, representing text as vectors is something that's in a, in a sense quite standard um, these days. So um, we also back extend the TNIC database to 1988. We think that's important in this context because we want to look at what's going on in the older firms too, where a lot of the older conglomerate literature suggests that diversification is more salient. Um, but a nice side effect of that is the TNIC database is updated on the web. And um, so with, with no further ado, uh, otherwise we're doing something very standard. We're taking CompuSat data. We're also bringing in asset redeployability data, which I'll get to later. Um, but it's, it's a very familiar database of US publicly traded firms. And so um, here's what, what Disney looks like, just to give you a sense. Uh, we, we see it 
really expanding its scope. So it's, it's representative of her overall conclusion. And you see that over time, it, it has more and more clusters of things that, you know, toys uh, and, and also some of the real estate plays that you might not have seen in the earlier 10Ks uh, produced by Disney. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna show you a bunch of stylized facts and then I'm gonna ask for clarifying questions in just a moment. But let me just take you through some stylized facts so we can get a sense for what the data looks like. So the first thing is I can sort firms into how many CompuStat segments you have and show you that our measure of scope where we're counting through the text is very positively correlated with it. And even if we use the NAICS manual to identify the text. So this is like validation. And, and we're not saying that CompuStat data is uninformative. We're just really trying to say that it systematically underreports uh, what, the, what the firms are doing. We can also sort firms by size, by assets, small to large. And we see that indeed, as firms are getting larger in assets, scale and scope are related. And those larger firms do cover more markets. It's true in CompuStat, but it's also true in, in our data. And I wanna show you that even if you restrict the sample to firms that have one CompuStat segment only, where all researchers in the past would have said that they're not scope firms, they have one segment. We, we still see a, a very considerable sorting as to how many markets you're in uh, versus size. And so um, I'll show you one more result and then I'll take questions. But uh, here, here I wanted to emphasize the second major stylized fact that I wanna show you. Okay, so the idea is the first one, scope is increasing over time. The second one is I wanna show you again, remind you what, what Gordon and I found in 2016 is that you can put companies into a, a space, a product market space where those that are close together sell the same products. Like this is Pepsi and Coke over here. Here you have banks, here you have a couple tech firms, right? And so the idea that, that really we wanna go right to what the finance literature has been telling us is that the finance literature, when it focuses on multi-product firms, they, they're thinking about firms that are far away in space. That is, you're like USX, you, you operate in steel and energy. That's a diversified conglomerate. And this black line up here shows you what that means in our space, right? That they're far away. But, but Panzer and Willig suggest that multi-product firms are more like I-11 and I-15. They're close together. And we wanted to just show you by sorting industry pairs into far and close at the industry pair level, where are the multi-product firms? And that's this table here. So we're sorting into deciles. One observation is a pair of industries. And we're just averaging the intensity at which companies jointly operate in the pair. And when the pair is least similar, they're diversified. We, we see that the fraction of firms operating there is 3% of all the, all the conglomerates we detect. But it's really those that are the most similar, the ones that Panzer and Willig says, this is where economies of scope lives. We have 39% of all the conglomerates we detect operating in these close together markets. So the second stylized fact is that the, the, the representative multi-product firm is just not diversified. It's not a diversified conglomerate, but rather it's a firm that's operating in these close in markets and trying to expand uh, through related firm technologies and know-how. So um, let me uh, pause for just a second and ask, are there any uh, clarifying questions I'd be happy to answer them at this point. Uh, great, Jerry. I, th I think uh, overall the audience is following very well. There's one uh, clarification question um, from, I believe, Gustavo uh, Schrankler. Um, he's asking, you know, how are the clusters labeled in this case? Is it based on human interpretation of the words or there is a particular algorithm? In yes. Outstanding question, uh, because it's one that we're actually trying to work on to make better. But to be clear, we do it three ways, okay? So one of them is based on the NAICS manual. So you have a very clear label for that because you can look at the manual, it tells you this one's furniture. Another, one, another method is based on the method Gordon and I used in our JPE, where we just find clusters through the distribution and statistically identify clusters. Those are not labeled. Uh, but, but they define a well-defined group of vocabulary, but there was no label. The ones that I showed you for Disney did have a label, and that one is based on latent Dirichlet allocation, 
where the, if you will, when you, when you do the topic model, you get the labels and we can report them directly. Uh, but I want to thank you for the comment, uh, Gustavo, because the fourth method that we're producing, we're still working on it, uh, will have some really, really high quality labels associated with it. Um, but it's still a work in progress, that particular aspect, a very challenging aspect indeed. Um, okay, so I have about 10 minutes left. And I, I just want to briefly note Jay, that when you have a you have a good question, an important question from um, Jill Grennan came through. Just oh, to... please. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to read that uh, to you. So uh, Jillian is asking, um, um, we'd like to hear how product uh, versus e-commerce and the general role of tech data ICT are uh, separated. Um, so it, it may relate to the concept of product versus service. Uh, in, in other, some companies don't have like a tangible product, but they actually have some, something that's more IP or you have B2B versus B2C, all these types of configurations. And what I wanna suggest is that we believe the framework we have is actually general enough to handle all of them. Why? Because a company that sells a service describes it in its 10K. And two companies that sell the same service are gonna have a very similar discussion. If your customers are B2B or B2C, you're still gonna describe it in your 10K. And if you're in the same market, you're still gonna be close together. And so any methods that we use to try to identify the multiple markets you're in should work simply because it's required by Regulation SK that you describe what your business is, what it is that you sell, regardless of whether it's tangible or intangible or who your customer is. So we, we think that we do pretty well here for the same reason that the TNIC industry classification performs well across those types of firms. Uh, are there other questions as well? Happy to answer more later on, uh, provide more detail as is helpful. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks yeah. for taking the question. I think. Uh... But we, we can, we can uh, continue. Okay. Absolutely. So I, I only have a little time. So I'm just going to say we do validation work where we look in the 10K for explicit statements. I sell a lot of products, that sort of thing. And we test whether our measure predicts that more strongly, if you will, than the CompuSet segment count. And the results are just very strong in this category. You see very high T stats for our variable and very low T stats for CompuSet. But I think the most important thing I want to really end on in the minutes I have left here before we got to turn it over to David, is that um, we, we want to understand why are these firms getting bigger? What are they doing in a corporate finance sense? And is it optimal, right? Because Panzer and Willig would suggest you're doing it because you have a cost advantage and that there's a positive net present value. And, and we also want to think, are you in fact doing what Henderson and Cockburn predict? That is, you're using R&D to facilitate it so that you can take your existing know-how and apply it in another market. And that is really very different from what we have in the corporate finance literature on diversified conglomerates. So our goal now is to run cross-sectional tests and, and try to predict the corporate finance policies and the performance of companies that are expanding scope. But it's very hard to do for the usual reason in corporate finance, everything is very endogenous. And so what, we are, what I'm gonna show you is that we're taking an approach where we're gonna to try to detect very strong ex ante incentives to increase scope that are plausibly exogenous in nature. And then we're gonna run an IV to actually run these tests. Okay, so in order to show you what I, what I have in mind here is that I'm gonna show you a spatial model of the product market again. And here you wanna think about a firm, it's close competitors that are in very related markets. And then you wanna think about it's kind of close competitors that are near to you spatially, okay, but they actually are a little bit further away. So you think if I'm coffee, these are more coffee companies around me. The outer band is more bakeries or maybe fruit, uh, fruit drinks, right? They're kind of related, but they're not quite where I am. And we wanna to try to think about the incentives the focal firm has to branch out into these close, but not so close markets because that's Panzer and Willig in a nutshell. And so how do we do it? Okay, the first approach to identify very strong ex ante incentives to expand is really based on asset redeployability. And we're, we're looking at Kim and Kung 2017 as a very interesting and really foundational paper, I think, on asset redeployability, where they show you can represent every industry as a 181 element vector 
of things you need, know-how, if you will, or assets in place to produce there. So every industry is represented by a 181 element vector of know-how and, and assets, right? And so what we want to ask, Panzer and Willig would tell us, does the vector of know-how that I have now closely resemble the vector of know-how that I would need to be in these far markets? Kim and Kung, because everything is vectorized, give us the, the flexibility to do that, as I can simply calculate the cosine similarity of the vector of know-how that I have and, and the one that I would need. And if ex ante, that similarity is very high, that's Panzer and Willig in a nutshell. It says that I should have a low cost of entry into that market because all the know-how that I already have is exactly what I need to produce at low cost in that new industry. So we're going to do that. Here's the, here's the formulation of it. And um, I don't have time to get into it. We, we have another measure that simply looks at the number of opportunities you have in the outer ring. Is there a lot of markets you could expand to? And, and that also, you can see the details in the paper. But let me just try to get to the final results I want to show you here, is that we do it in two stages. We first regress our scope variables on the instruments, and, and these results are extremely strong. When you have this redeployability potential or more opportunities, you do expand scope ex post. And on to the main results then is this, is that we now can use our instrumented scope. Yep. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. You still have four minutes, so I Perfect. don't want to could rush too much. That's yeah. just, just what I need. So, um, so I, I wanted to show you that our instrumented scope variable, again, using that first stage and, and, and sort of getting the predicted value for our scope variable based on those incentives. Um, and, and we have a Fermier panel here where now we're looking at the dependent variable being, do you do mergers? Do you acquire? Do you do more R&D? Okay, do you do more CapEx? The results show that in order to expand scope when you have these incentives, you tend to do it through more acquisitions and you sell assets less frequently, and you also do more R&D, giving a lot of credibility to the ideas in Thies and Henderson and Cockburn that the R&D is there to help you retool the assets you have to produce in the new market. And, and in some markets, especially non-tech, we find that the primary way to grow is through acquisitions. What we find in, in subsamples that are more tech oriented that the R&D methodology seems to prevail. The, the other main result I wanted to show you is that the conglomerate literature of old um, says that multi-product configurations, it tries to suggest is, is a very bad governance model to use because of these divisional conflicts and agency. And then the old literature shows that diversified conglomerates have low valuations. While it's true that many papers since then have challenged whether there's a discount, okay, there hasn't been a whole lot in this literature about what's, what else can we learn beyond that there maybe is not a discount. Okay, what we want to suggest is that the Panzer and Willig Foundation just predicts the opposite, that this is value creating and rational and there's no agency problem here. In fact, you can produce similar related products in one division. You don't need many divisions, particularly if you have good tech, right? And so our prediction is good performance. And so what I wanna show you here, again, using the instrumented model that when you have higher scope, we see higher market to book ratios. That's a premium for multi-product firms. We see high sales growth as you're facilitating your scope growth. And we, we also see high asset growth uh, the one thing we don't see is higher profitability ratios. And, and that, I don't have time to get into the logic, but if you read the paper, we, we try to uh, illustrate that the way a firm's gonna increase its scope is it's gonna choose the best options first. So as you're expanding further, while you're creating value, you're not necessarily improving your ratio of profitability. We show that a lot of this expansion is generated through equity financing consistent with the use of intangibles and R&D, um, not surprising. And one, one last result that I, I know I didn't have time to cover today, but if you're interested, you can look at it in the paper, is we try to take a new look at this pattern of increasing concentration over time. If we adjust HHIs for scope, we find that in fact, um, concentration ratios are not really increasing that much. It's just that firms are increasing scope and they're in more markets. But once you account for that, the HHIs are in fact lower. 
um, but I don't have time to get into those details. That's in the paper. And so uh, I am uh, out of time by my clock, so I'm just going to uh, conclude here, is that we're really trying to argue that the conglomerate literature should think about a new model that's emerging, that this is you know, 2021, it's not 1994, where diversification might have been the right theme. But now what we're seeing is more consistent with Panzer and Willig value creating product market expansion and and that the diversified conglomerate as a concept is actually very rare in our data relative to this new type of a model and so uh, we, we we hope we also are providing some new ways of thinking about multi-product firms new data and methods that could be used in other settings as well and and so with that um i'll stop and turn it over to david thank you thank you thank you very much for the uh, fantastic talk uh, you're right on time. Um, David uh, uh, is now going to discuss the paper. And David, you can share your screen here. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Um, it says, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to discuss this paper. It's a it's a really interesting paper, and um, and I want to just before I begin, I just want to make two brief apologies. One, I'm actually speaking in a in a public space, and people may be trickling in in the background a little bit. Um, and the second thing is that I'm going to have to leave abruptly after I finish my discussion, so I'm going to have to circle back to Jerry and Bill and the others to find out more about the discussion that you guys have about this paper. Um, and I'm very sorry for that. Um, so let me just. Give a quick overview. Um, so, you know, really, in some ways, the the, the the punchline of this paper is that the scope of the firm, of the modern firm, has expanded a lot over the last 30 years. And to show that, what the way this paper works is you can think about sort of using the vocabulary used to describe an industry. You can create vectors of that vocabulary. Those vectors kind of define what you might think of as like a hotel and galaxy. You know, we're way beyond the world of a hotel and arm. Maybe I should call it a Hoberg Phillips galaxy since there's the guys that did this. But, but basically, what, what we're saying is that you, you think about firm scope is like how many different constellations do a firm's products fit into? And that number has been growing a lot over the last 30 years. So, first of all, that's just a really interesting and important fact. Just full stop right there. But then the paper goes on and it says, you know, firstly, like, well, how do you think about corporate and investment policies, you know, sort of fueling the increase in scope that we're seeing? And I'm not really doing the paper justice because there is a, there's a lengthy, uh, you know, part of the paper that's attempting to develop an instrument to tackle sort of the inherent endogeneity of a firm's product market decisions and it's and the whole other set of corporate finance decisions it makes. But putting that to one side, just looking at sort of what pops out of it, you see that like how are firms growing scope? They're becoming more acquisitive and they're divesting less. So they're sort of becoming larger storehouses of human capital, if you will. They're, they're buying other firms, they're increasing the R&D, and that's sort of, they're, they're sort of building these treasure chests of, uh, of intellectual capital inside the firm. How do they do that? They do that largely through equity issuance, uh, not, not so much through debt issuance. And then, uh, you know, Jerry didn't really have a chance to talk about this much in the discussion, but I think one of a really interesting and important part of this paper is that he, he, you can use this scope variable as a way of speaking to this bigger discussion about uh, industry, about firm, industries getting more concentrated over time. In other words, the world sort of getting less competitive. And you know, in some ways, this paper is saying, well, is, is that really true? Are we living in a world where, where markets are less competitive? Not so clear, um, because what seems to be happening is firms are competing head to head across a much broader field of competition than you might have captured using uh, more, you know, using yesterday's measurement tools. And so I think that's, um, I think that's a super important point here. And I, I want to say a little bit more about that. So in terms of like, um, so, so I guess the, he talked a lot about diversification and you want to think about this, like we used to think it. So the picture on the left 
is a picture of a data point 2200, which is arguably the first personal computer that's ever made. Now, that was a company that had a diversified product line. It offered, you know, telephonic equipment, personal computers, mainframes, stuff like that. And it failed. And it failed in the 80s. It was part of the sort of the, the uh, you know, the, the death of diversification that occurred in sort of the late 80s. On the right, you have the new Apple Mac Pro. Obviously, you know, ostensibly the modern incarnate of the previous thing. And so, you know, Jerry did a great job of unpacking the fact that this is not a story about diversification in the way that we're used to thinking about it. I'm going to come back to this at the end. So there's sort of two possible directions I can go here. One would be, which would be very appropriate for the audience, would be to dig into the methodological side of this and to sort of help readers understand the limitations and challenges associated with the, the actual technical constructs that he's using in order to, to, to tell us what he's telling us. Um, and I, I have absolutely no ability to do that whatsoever. So in fact, what I'm gonna do is focus on the conceptual and, and really and, and ask sort of, what do these results mean for everyday Joes like me who are really interested in understanding what firms are and what firms do? And so that's really how I'm going to focus my uh, the comments that I have, and and I leave it to others on the on the call to to, to tackle and uh, to take up the methodological questions. Okay, as I see it, I sort of have like three broad conceptual issues that I'd like to raise. One has to do with the sample. Uh, one is more a matter of taste and has to do with sort of connections to finance and economics. And then one, uh, the third is kind of what I'll say is more of a speculative thing. Um, you know, in, in other words, what is it that firms actually do? And this paper has got me thinking that maybe we actually don't know that as well as we think we do. Um, so let me take these each in turn. First of all, the sample. You need a 10K in order to be in this data set. Now, there's an important issue with that. The number of public firms has declined dramatically over the last 30 years. We were at a high of around 8,000. You can see that on the graph on the right. We were at a high of about 8,000 public firms in the U.S. in the, late, in the mid to late 1990s. And we hit a, a trough of around 3,600 public firms a few years ago. The number's ticking up. So I point this out for a couple of reasons. Um, it, it is not like firms have been randomly selected into uh, out of the public market. The composition of the sample of public firms has changed in really important ways over the last 30 years. And so, you know, that's not a, that's not intended to be a damning criticism of the work here, but I think it colors the way you want to think about the results that you're seeing. In other words, what is the, we're talking about the scale and scope of publicly held firms. What's been going on? There has been, sorry, where did my, where did I go? There has been an explosion in private, in the private markets. So private markets at the beginning of this sample were a, a trivial distraction that could be safely ignored by people who are interested in understanding sort of the broader economy. Now they are an $8 trillion asset class. And so, you know, that, is, that has important implications for how we think about understanding the results. Because I think what's happening is sort of the, the public private margin, if you will, is being, um, is, is changing over time. And we're looking at the sample of remaining public firms in his data. And what we're learning is that, well, scope in the private firm sector is expanding dramatically. What's happening, uh, is, that because, uh, is that because firms that are unable to amplify their scope are failing? Or is it because, that, is it because uh, firms that operate in more narrow, uh, operate uh, a, a smaller set of products are better targets for private equity? I think there's a lot, there are a lot of questions that, um, that, that this connects to. Um, you know, some of your results about R&D and about being acquisitive, when we think about private markets, one of the, the far and away the most common form of exit from the private equity investment 
is the sales of another firm, right? And so in some ways, what we may be seeing is like private markets are sort of uh, sort of helping assets and ideas to be recombined in ways that create these larger scope organizations. Um, so I think that's something you got to take. I think you got to take that, tackle that head on. The the changing number of public firms over time and the changing composition of public firms over time. Um, second point is connections to finance and economics. And so you know, he did a really nice job of going after a lot of questions that are sort of near and dear to people who do court finance. And but I guess I would argue to, to me, I, I find those less interesting, or let me say it, let me say it differently. We've had a couple of massive macroeconomic shocks that would imagine are part and parcel of this story. We've seen China enter the World Trade Organization and we saw this gale of offshoring that ensued from that. And that disrupted the way that firms did business and it probably changed the optimal scale and hence the optimal scope of the firm. We've seen a, a, an explosion in digital communication with consumers. And that you, you know, we went from ads on TVs to now we reach consumers through their Instagram feed on a smartphone while they're sitting on a bus you know, going to work. Um, we've also had changing regulatory stance that you know, people like Thomas Philippon have argued favor um, companies over markets, or in other words, companies over customers. Um, any of these big sort of large scale macro factors could easily be a major part of the explanation for what's going on here. And I personally, and again, I, I said at the beginning that this is more a reflection of my own taste, but I feel like those are first order questions that immediately pop to mind when you see this cool new way of thinking about firm scope. And so when I got to thinking about this, it was like, you know, what, can I say something useful or productive to Jerry? And, and, because, you know, instead of just being critical, here's, here's something perhaps you could do. What if you could repeat this analysis using EU firm data where we've had a very different regulatory posture vis-a-vis -vis firms and markets over the last 20 or 30 years. See if you get the same kind of progression and scope there that you get here. Um, see if the scope measures are affected by the degree to which an industry was shocked by import penetration from China. Look at things like that as a way of trying to sort of tackle the root causes of this. I guess, I guess my, in my personal view, I feel like when you jump like you're jumping over a lot of interesting terrain when you jump from firm scope is increased to what are managers actually doing to make this happen? I feel like managers are reacting to a bunch of stuff that's out there in the in the macro economy, and that that's super important for understanding this better. I apologize, the room is filling up, and I know it may be getting noisy to you guys. Um, that gets me to my third and final point. What is it that firms actually do? Okay. The part that I didn't tell you about these two pictures is that both of these firms are conglomerate. They're both multi-product firms. Datapoint failed. They sold a clunky desktop PC. They sold telephones. They sold all kinds of other stuff. Apple succeeds. That's a hugely diversified business. They are a record company. They are. Uh, they make phones. They make. You know. They provide entertainment. They provide hardware. It, it, you know. You, it takes, it takes a leap of faith to argue that they are not diversified by, by using the standard old school conception of what it means to be diversified. I would actually argue though that Apple is not diversified and DataPoint was diversified because what I wanna say is that I think that we actually have the wrong model of what it is that firms do. Or the thing that I came away with this paper asking myself was, what if we just really don't understand what firms do? So look, like, let's think about sort of the true way we were all taught to think about what a firm does. A firm sells a product at a profit. Like that's sort of the old model. Like they max it, like what does it mean to maximize profit? Well, it used to, it used to think about this as it means we're going to build a better mousetrap. We're going to sell it profitably. 
We're going to grow the market share of people who understand that their need can be filled by this product. And a firm developed an audience, if you will, as a byproduct of making a product that people wanted to buy. That's kind of the old model of how we think about what a firm is. I wonder if what's really happening here is that we have the wrong model of what a firm is and what a, fir what a firm's objective is, is to capture an audience. And so they're not really interested so much in like starting with the product and getting to, getting to the customer. What they're interested in doing is getting the customer and then feeding products, in, putting different products in front of that customer's face as a way of fulfilling the affinity that they've developed with that customer. So you can think about examples like, you know, um, you know, if you're a car lover or, you know, a fashion lover, you can think about, you know, Britain versus Italy, you know, in terms of like affinities uh, uh, of things that resonate with customers. People are Ford people versus Chevy people, Toyota people versus Honda people. That's got more to do with like how well the, the, the CD player works inside the car, right? It's, the firms have invested resources to create affinities with customers, and then they just evolve the mix of products that they put in front of them as a mechanism for extracting rent from that audience relationship. And so, that, so I came away with this paper thinking that perhaps we need more thought about that. Like that's really the model of, of a firm that we should be trying to understand. Or maybe if we worked with a model like that, we would get different answers in terms of what diversification looks like. I'll conclude because I am really out of time. Not surprisingly, this is a fascinating and thought-provoking paper. It's exactly what I've come to expect from these two authors. And it really helps you understand how what you measure tells, you know, it colors what you think you know. And when you change the way you measure something, you really, you, you really begin asking fundamental questions about the nature of the phenomena itself. So kudos to this whole conference for, for, for this kind of work. Um, to me, as a matter of personal taste, I don't see the connections to financial policy, financial decision making as being the highest return on investment here. I would think about uh, the measurement exercise in terms of the broader context of systemic and, and regulatory uh, changes in business. And I love, love, love how this speaks to the debate around growing concentration. And I would love to see much more there. I mean, one, one simple answer here might be that we don't understand competition very well and we'd have a different answer about firms getting more competitive. We would change the way we measure, but we would also have very different regulatory policy if we had different tools. I regret that I have to stop here, but I look forward to catching up with the organizers to find out more about the discussion that's about to follow. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, David, uh, for the uh, great discussion. Um, uh, Jerry, do you want to take uh, you know some time to respond to that while we collect questions from the audience? Yes, yeah, my pleasure. And and first, I, I just really wanted to thank David for just outstanding, thought-provoking and visionary comments. I'm going to try to talk about some of them, uh, but I, I wanted to say that I agree with David in so many ways because as I as I try to articulate our thoughts on them, you're going to see that they actually relate to some things that are future research or works in progress. And they're, and they're actually very challenging, but, but also very important to actually consider. So on, on to uh, David's first comment was about the sample. And, and yes, uh, we are limited by 10 Ks here. And I think that if I was given that comment from David, you know, uh, eight years ago, I would have told him, what else can I do? Because private firms don't provide any text. It's, a, it's not the answer I want to give, and it's not the answer I'm going to give today. Because actually, I want to, want to note that um, Gordon and I have been working with private company text uh, through an NSF grant where we're trying to cover 1 million private firms and watch their product text evolve in time series. How do we do it? Uh, it's through corporate websites harvested from the Wayback Machine over many years. And so going forward, I, I totally agree with David. We got to think about those private firms. And hopefully um, that will become possible. One can think about international firms as well, uh, which is on our horizon, um, but that one we haven't developed as much <clears throat> quite as, as of yet. <clears throat> David's uh, second suggestion was really thinking about these connections and, and other predictions about regulation or major changes going on in the economy and shocks. I can't agree more. And I think that the scope 
framework will facilitate that kind of research. But here I actually want to push back just a little bit because I do think that it's important for this being the very first paper on this topic as we see it and on this data to show that the primitive way that the data works is consistent and logical. We want to establish and validate it. And I think that the um, Panzer and Willig framework is really the idea we had, and we're seeing a lot of support for that. And I think that if we can get others you know, to agree that the foundation is what it is, then the, the understanding of what you're going to get when you ask some of these more out of the box questions will be that much more rigorous and easy to understand. Um, but I totally agree. And, and so the last, uh, the last uh, comment David has was, was on the conceptual. And, and here um, uh, I certainly uh, you know, agree. And there, there's a lot of very uh, thought provoking comments that he, he gave. And so one of them was on you know, what, what is the firm doing? Like, is it trying to capture an audience or is it trying to generate profits? And, and so that captures my heart and mind too. Um, I'm just really agreeing with David that, that we really have to think differently. The world is changing and, and can we do it? Well, here, here is where I think some of the framework that in a sense, using the corporate websites, okay, that's a corporate website's goal is not just profit and, and sales, right? Because that can be done on the shelf in the store, but that's often about the hearts and minds, the audience, what David was looking for. Do you want to attract audience? I think looking at what's going on in the corporate website space and scope in that sense, and then comparing it to what's going on in the 10K, which is more the, the literal, here's the products I sell, and when they're different, okay, could actually um, you know, speak to that question, uh, but that's uh, more to come and a lot of development is still needed as far as the technology to get there. So I'll stop there, thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Jerry. Uh I, I completely agree uh, with you that there's even richer information that you can you can exploit from the website. Um, uh, if I may just you know build on um, actually David's discussion and your response a little bit, uh, we, we do see, especially through our seminar series, the rise of platforms and big data economy. So so I know here we have an emphasis on the product descriptions, um, but in general, um, it, it would be great to you know, use this data set or some other text-based data to explore you know, more dynamic considerations and how, for example, data is feeding back. That, that creates this uh, uh, increase in scope because you get information from the users and you, you know what they want and you have the user base. Um, you know, it's related to network effect um, and how we utilize data, uh, which doesn't exclude uh, improving or innovations in, in products. But at the same time, uh, I, I'm just personally curious, right? Whether it's coming from that data consideration, user-based consideration versus pure cross-sell uh, capacities, right? The traditional product uh, relationship. Uh, it would be great to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that, that's a really thought-provoking question. And, and I think that we might be able to test it, but let me just remind you why, why it is really thought-provoking because the way I see our foundation as Panzer and Willig is really about sort of thinking about the cost production technology and, and making that sort of be able to leap across boundaries through, through tech. But, but your point is, is an entirely different mechanism that would also incentivize scope expansion. That's not really the Panzer and Willig one. So it's its own theory in a sense and it's very interesting. And that is that if I, if I have this customer base and that customer base also buys something else, right? Sort of on a platform, then I, I could probably cross that product market boundary too. And, and the reason why I'm good at doing it, in a sense, is not necessarily the production technology I have, but that I happen to have the customers already sitting there and I can just put something else in their plates. Um, I have to think about the, the implementation or testability, but um, I know uh, Gordon is also here, is also taking notes, and, and that's something that we will definitely think about, and I think it's relevant. Thanks. Uh, and I know Marcus has a question here. Max, you want to ask directly? Yeah. Great talk, really interesting paper. Um, I have a more conceptual question and that's about what is scope here? And the way how you define it is just if a firm is in a certain market, but you didn't talk about how much it is in a certain market. So I take this portfolio perspective, I do not only care what I buy, but also how much I buy. Uh, if I take the example of Apple, if they 
are selling bags for their laptops, you can use the words that are part of the product description and say they're in the luggage business. But really, they're not a player in that type of um, industry, right? So first of all, I'm wondering if you think there is a way to assign weights of how much they're crossing product boundaries. So how relevant is this reach over into the other industry? And related to the idea of diversification, one reason why you want to reach out into other industries could also be because there's some kind of diversification effect. But then I would claim you might be able to detect that in, for example, return data. So if you claim a company in several industries, the returns of that conglomerate should have more correlations with companies that are in specific industries, right? So it can test to some degree the magnitude of the scope expansion. What are your yeah. thoughts about that? Yeah, so, so thank you so much. There's a couple comments there, and, and they're very good ones. And they're also ones that we've thought about a lot. And, and I don't know how far we can fully get to answer your question, but, but the one of weights is challenging. So what we can do is, and we've tried this in some of our HHI calculations just to show robustness, is that the, some of the, the vocabularies you have more of, like you have one third of it could be cell phone, but only 10% of it could be telecom, right? So we can weight your presence in the markets by the amount of text that you devote to that one, which is good because it, it reflects that diversity, right? But I think what you would probably really want me to do is to actually be able to allocate how much of my sales is in each of those sectors, which is sort of the way that we think about in the CompuStat world. But we have not found a way to actually do that and because the company is not explicitly uh, putting a dollar amount by every word in the 10K, but it's something that we're aware of and we're pondering. Um, and so I, I would just add, um, you, you mentioned the return uh, distribution stuff, and, and I wanted to note that in, in our appendix, we, we actually have been looking at that sort of issue. And I'll add one more result, is that we find that as you're adding more products uh, to your portfolio, remember that most of them are the close in kind, only a little bit of it is the far away diversification kind. We're actually finding that, the, that these conglomerates have higher risk, right? So when you expand, products, we see that your risk profile is higher, not lower. And, and one reason why we think that's the case is that we're finding a lot of evidence that innovation and in R&D is one of the primary means to the end of, of this expansion. And, and of course, R&D is a very risky activity, and therefore, it's actually increasing risk. But I would note that when we do find the pairs that are far away, uh, that, that's where you finally see a diversification effect, and, that, and that's where you have a little bit of a lower um, risk profile, but, but that's only a, a relatively small fraction of the observed uh, multi-product firms. I'm not sure if I got into everything. Uh, please uh, remind me if you want a little more on any of those topics. Thanks. That's a really great answer. Yeah. Uh, in the interest of time, let's just take one more question from Jillian. Jillian, you can unmute yourself. So thank you. I really, hopefully you can hear me now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Awesome. I really enjoyed the paper um, so much. Uh, one thing that I'm, and this is just more a, a dream list and sort of the David sense of it. I, I think what you're doing is so cool is the, I actually would like the classic synergy question. And I don't know if you've looked at the revenue recognition at all. So like the classic first footnote in the 10 Ks. I've recently looked through some like AT&T and some of the other ones, and they're very phenomenal to read through how they're doing at it. But I think you could really get at, and which is to me, one of the questions, is this coming really from technology and out pure cost energy? And this is why we can expand the scope to these sort of adjacent markets, or is it actually coming from the customers? And so I think that way in the revenue recognition, you could almost apply the exact same methodology there. And then we'd have a really better understanding of where this is all coming from and coming together. And I, I don't know, and that interests me. So I'm just putting it out there. Thank you. Yes, Th thank you for that comment. I, I entirely agree. So right now we've been working with the CompuStat, you know, balance sheet, income statement, cash flow type of analysis. But uh, I have also seen what's in that item eight of the 10K. And, and I think that could influence many research projects. But you're right, particularly this one, because it, we're really trying to show mechanism. Kanzer and Willig is saying it's a certain story. David has some other ideas as well, uh, as did Will, right? And so um, I, I totally agree. And uh, we'll, 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 we'll think about that thoroughly. Great, I think we are right on time. 
Um, thank you so much um, you know, to our speakers, to Jerry, to David, and to uh, all the, all the uh, participants. Let's give uh, Jerry a, a big round of virtual applause here. And I'm going to do that on my side as well. <laughs> Before we enter the unrecorded uh, discussion part, uh, I would also like to announce that this is our final webinar of the year as we have the winter holidays coming. We will resume our webinars next year and we have a exciting set of speakers lined up, um, including uh, Jen Ching Fan from Princeton. You know, we'll update um, all of you uh, from our website. So uh, with that, uh, we wish you uh, all a great uh, festive season ahead. And for those who would like to stay for our informal discussion, please stay in this Zoom room and we'll upgrade you to the panelists. Thank you.